Hi, fantasy readers. This is Corinne Norton, your fellow book binger, and you are listening to the Finding Fantasy Reads podcast, where you can test out a new fantasy story every single week to find your next favorite author. You'll want to stick around for today's episode if you like stories on the high seas mixed with mermaids and mayhem. It's written by Kelly N. Jane, who writes fantasy with characters who wear a crown, wield a sword, and follow epic adventures. Then she stirs in some ancient mythology with a splash of romantic fairy tale magic. Today, you get both my brother and me as narrators because it's told from a dual point of view. Stick around to the end or check out today's show notes to see where you can find more from the author, as well as how to enter this month's giveaway. For now, please enjoy Realm of Sea Castles by Kelly N. Jane. Chapter 1. Errold. We were the last dragon ship on the beach. The other raiders had already shoved off and were raising their sails in the distance. Where are you, Dag? I mumbled. I'd fought to have command of my first ship this season. Choosing my childhood friends as shipmates might not have been a good idea. Every port had yielded as much trouble as treasure. Errold! Gorn called from where he sat on one of the crates we'd acquired from the village. I turned toward him and he nodded something over my shoulder with an arched brow and a twinkle in his eye. Curious, I spun to see two young women strolling down the beach toward us. Gorn rose and met me while we waited. The gods have blessed us, my friend. It seems so. We'd not taken any thralls over the summer. The practice of keeping women as slaves didn't sit well with me, but I couldn't reject a gift from the gods. Both women wore their long hair loose over their shoulders, one's tresses golden, the other raven-colored. Their dresses were like some I'd seen on tavern girls, though neither had shoes. As they neared, their crystalline lilac eyes sparkled like gems. When the fair-haired maiden smiled at Gorin, I met the grin of the other. She had an expression that sang of mischief. It drew me a few steps closer. Hey! Gorin shouted. It all happened in a heartbeat. The maiden nearest Gorin grabbed a golden chalice from an open chest and sprinted away, with the other woman following her. After a second to gather our wits, Gorin and I gave chase. Stay with the spoils, I called to a warrior who'd lounged on the ship's rail. The sand pulled at our feet, making for slow progress, but we gained on them. The women seemed to have more trouble navigating the beach than we did. Gorin wrapped his arms around the waist of the woman who held the gold. I didn't have it as easy. The other maiden kicked and fought until I tackled her to the ground, getting a taste of sandy grit between my teeth. I'd thought I had her pinned, but she was as slippery as an eel. She rolled over and shoved a dagger between us. The sharp edge nicked my throat as she glared. That's unnecessary. I'll not hurt you, but you will have to come with me. I stood and reached out my hand, ignoring the dagger now positioned near my knee. Even as she glared, there was that sparkle again. A sensation crossed my mind that I'd played right into her hands instead of the other way around. Before I could think too much about it, though, shouts and the ring of metal on metal grew louder from a nearby alley in the village. Take them to the ship and tie them, I shouted at Gorin as I shoved the second woman toward him. Pulling an axe from my belt, I charged forward. Dag emerged around the corner, leading the rest of the crew, while elves from the village attacked. They were no match for my men, and my friend's big grin showed through his bushy red beard. I met the first male with a block to his arm as he swung a short sword from my head. Punching him in the jaw, I sent him staggering back, then drove my axe into his neck. Done with their fun, my friends dispatched two more of the attackers before the rest came to their senses and sprinted away. Where have you three been? I got myself caught, had a rope around my neck and everything, Dag laughed as he told of the mishap. The others had to save me from the rope burns when all those skinny devils realized they couldn't lift me. All the men roared with laughter as I shook my head. Dag was a huge Telana elf who liked to say his mother was a giantess. In truth, he'd been found abandoned near our village on the north shore of Iburn and didn't know who his parents were, but it made a good story for a male nearly seven feet tall. I slapped Dag on the back as we headed to the ship. When I'm bound for Kalos, it will be because of you, I'm sure. 
we each grabbed the side of a crate and hoisted it up to the others who'd already climbed aboard the ship. You're welcome, Dag said with a laugh. Chapter 2. Dessa Of all the maids I'd sent out, I knew it would be my sweet Mara and Mary who found the perfect match I sought. I'd watched the brave Talana, who rampaged through village after village for years. They were my kind of warriors. The poor boy my girls chose didn't have a clue. A hearty laugh exploded from me, and it felt good after such lengthy boredom. I tapped my long nails on the arm of my throne. The red glow of the scorpion fish kept the dais cozy, a perfect place for intimate conversation. I conjured another chair, smaller, made of twisted gray pumice rather than the shiny black basalt of mine, but it would be perfect for my next prince. There was only the matter of getting him to me. If I dragged him here to my underwater fortress, I'd have to keep him locked up. I growled under my breath. That stupid treaty I'd signed with my sister to end our war would haunt me forever. Anyone I brought against their will would have the right to leave, so it required that I make a mutually acceptable deal with them. I wanted the company, and a prince would be the perfect escort to parties and boring diplomatic sessions. It wouldn't do to have him trying to run off all the time. That meant I'd need to find a way to make him come with me voluntarily. I'd have to craft an offer he couldn't refuse. I rose from the throne and swam across the large gathering hall. More research needed to be done. In the middle of the large room, I hovered, my beautiful black scales glistening as I tried to remember the last time I'd thrown a party. Eons ago, it seemed. That needed to change. I was beautiful and in the prime of life. The seas were my playground, the place for me to unwind and relax. It was time to put myself first. I chuckled, knowing that was always the case, but I deserved to have someone by my side. Mara and Mary had performed well. Through the pearls on their necklaces, I could monitor all that happened on the surface. They'd even gotten the handsome leader to carry them aboard so they didn't touch the water. I couldn't have them returning to their mermaid forms before he had agreed to my terms, after all. He'd tied my poor girls up, though. They must be feeling as if they were about to be filleted for dinner. I'd find a way to make it up to them when they made it home. It was time I headed to the surface and spoke to Errold myself. Chapter 3. Errold the fire we'd set on the docks burned bright and reflected the orange glow on the water as our oars cut through the bay. Keeping the village's ships from following made sense, but the fire was spreading to other buildings. It wasn't something I could voice aloud, but I didn't feel good about it. You shouldn't worry about those people, the dark-haired maiden said, getting my attention. What are you talking about? I sighed and lounged back against the edge of the ship. She unnerved me with how she kept staring at me like she knew a secret I didn't, then mentioning something I was thinking about. The girl was off, somehow. We'd untied them both once we pushed off from shore, which may have been a mistake. The people back there are a waste of your energy. There are more important ones under the surface of the waves, beneath this ship, who should hold your thoughts. She smiled at me and flicked her brows. I shook my head, catching the smug look that passed between the two girls. What are your names? I'm Mara, and this is Mary. You need to keep quiet about those under the sea, Gorin said in answer to Mara's comment. He was always making sure to say a blessing to the goddess Rand before we sailed, so she wouldn't drag us to the bottom in her net. Your goddess isn't who I'm speaking of. She's formidable, true, but I'm talking of her sister, Dessa, Mara said. That's enough, Dag ordered. Apparently, Gorn wasn't the only one concerned. I think we should discuss the different goddesses once we're home. I didn't need her stirring up the men. It was late in the season, and we might face a storm or two. Having them constantly worried that we'd sink could create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mary crossed her arms over her chest and pouted. She twisted to peer out on the waves but when a spray from the oars splashed over the railing, she nearly jumped into my lap to stay away from it. I caught her, laughing. Would you like to sit with me? I'll protect you. Pushing off my chest, she returned to her seat. 
You're right that you shouldn't mock the Sea Queen, but you should also respect her. Mara picked up her conversation, ignoring the angry glares of the crew. They'd stopped rowing. Since the seas were too calm for the sail, we floated aimlessly. We do, Gorin said, stalking closer to Mara. You need to stay silent. If you speak her name and provoke her, it will be all our necks. I'll throw you overboard before I let that happen. She hasn't said anything disrespectful. I moved between my friend and Mara. Don't worry about some thrall and her crazy mouth. He doesn't scare me. If Dessa chooses this ship for her prize, that is her right. Don't you ever shut up. I ran my hand through my hair. It wasn't going to take much more for the men to toss her and Mary over the side. They aren't joking. Neither am I. First, she'd call the rains and pelt all of you with the sting of each drop. Then would come the winds, strong enough to spin this ship in circles until the waves built and brought you high in the air. You would either flip over backward or roll sideways. Either way, Dessa would have new treasures for her trove. Gorin lunged for Mara, and I threw myself in front of him. He was at least a hand taller than me. Even though I was a good deal more than six feet, he also had me by twenty pounds. I raised my arms in a gesture for him to calm down, but he must have taken that as a sign I was about to throw a punch. The next thing I knew, I had to duck or have knuckles embedded in my jaw. I barreled into Gorin's chest, and we flew into some crates sitting in the center of the ship. From there, everything erupted into chaos. Chapter 4. Dessa They were so amusing. Mara had done a grand job working the men into a frenzy. What a precious girl. Though I wasn't convinced that Errold was defending me. It almost appeared as though he cared about Mara. I huffed at myself for the ridiculous thought. The others were properly afraid of my power, and making sure they stayed respectful. The more they grappled and tossed themselves about, the more likely it was that my prince might become hurt and unable to swim. I couldn't have that. I pushed a little wave from my fingers and allowed it to slam into the bottom of the boat. Those men were so wrapped up in fighting and knocking each other around, they didn't even pay attention. It was going to take a bigger bump. Flicking my hand with more emphasis, the next wave bounced the end of the ship out of the water. A large body came overboard, flopping around under the waves, trying to figure out which end was up. That should get their attention. Sure enough, all motion on board stopped. I smiled and longed to rise above the surface and see the looks on their faces in person. But I'm a patient woman. Another splash sounded, and a body sliced through the water more graceful than those blasted dolphins. I backed myself out of immediate sight as I watched Errold rescue the flailing man. He grabbed an oar to steady himself as he hoisted the larger body into the waiting hands of those leaning over the edge of their ship. As soon as Errold was alone, I moved closer. Circling around, I came into his view, and his eyes popped open wide. He had time before he needed another breath. Until then, I'd let him enjoy the form I took underwater. The way my golden hair fanned out around my entire torso, and the iridescent black scales of my lower body glittered. Even in the low light, I was spectacular. My alabaster skin sparkled like moonlight in the dark, showing off my otherworldly beauty that would snare his senses. He shook his head and kicked his legs with a giant heave. It was as if he wanted to go back to those mortals. Didn't he know it was a privilege to see me in this form? With an easy flip of my tail, I reached him in a heartbeat and created a bubble around the two of us. Slowly, I allowed us to float with the waves until he realized it was safe to breathe. Where were you trying to go? Don't you want to hear my offer? I asked, moving slowly since he was so skittish. With gentle fingers, I pulled his hand into mine. It was cold. Poor dear. Who are you? He gasped as he spoke, still distrusting the air I'd provided. With a tilt of my head, I offered him a smile. 
Chapter 5. Errold. With a glance to the surface, I realized I was too far down to reach the boat. Whoever this woman was, she wasn't a woman, but was she really what she seemed? Mermaids were from stories told around the hearth after a few rounds of mead, weren't they? Had I died? I could breathe, though. She'd surrounded us with some type of bubble, and it provided me the air I needed and allowed me to float without effort. I gently ran my fingers along the inside of the springy surface. An uncomfortable silence lingered. I licked my salty lips before I asked again who she was. "'Who do you think I am?' she finally answered. Her voice crooned with a blend of sweet maiden and seductress. It was difficult to keep my wits. "'The goddess Ran controls the deep, but the stories I've heard of her don't match your beauty.' When in doubt, flattery was always a good option. At least, that was my experience above the surface. She has charge of some parts of the ocean, that's true. But she is just one of many, all of whom answer to me. My dear boy, I am Dessa, the queen of the deep, among other places. It was the worst thing she could have said. The stories of the goddess of night and chaos had been the ones I couldn't listen to as a young child. She was the opposite of her younger sister, the goddess of light and order. For all the terror Dessa's stories created, her beauty was unparalleled. Such a conflict swirled within me. I didn't know how to respond. "'Why have you spared me?' I blurted. Better to go with whatever came to mind first. "'Because I desire to make you my prince.' You'll be at my side when I'm here, and have more privileges than any other within the dark fortress. Any treasure you wish will be yours. That was unexpected and terrifying, yet oddly appealing. A light tingling rolled through me. An overwhelming urge compelled me closer. If I had to die, it would be worth it. You'll have to answer to me, and agree to be my prince— I can't have you changing your mind later. That would be so disappointing, she cooed and floated closer. Mesmerized, I stared into her eyes. They were as clear blue as the Mediterranean, until I caught my reflection in her pupils. My hair, dark in the water, floated around my face and my brown eyes in such a contrast to hers. With a heaving sigh, I slammed my lids shut and shook my head to clear my thoughts. When I opened them again, Dessa's expression had turned cold. How could I have wanted to be with her? With my wits returned, I searched for an escape. I'm afraid that I'll have to decline your generous offer, my beautiful queen. There is still so much of the world I need to explore. Perhaps when the folly of my youth has passed, I can join you. I was confident this wasn't a negotiable situation. However, her words niggled at my mind. She'd needed me to agree. What would happen now that I hadn't? I glanced at the surface again. That is not a wise choice. Her body grew larger, crowding the space in our bubble. You see, that is part of the problem, I told her. I'm always making foolish choices. You don't want that in your prince. It's better if I gain some more experience. The water, which she'd warmed for me, grew cold once more. Chapter 6. Dessa This boy was stronger than I thought. It confirmed he was definitely the right choice. Perhaps he needed a little convincing, in a manner he'd understand. With a blink of my eye, I transformed into a whiny human maiden. The long, black gown flowed over my useless legs and only showed the delicate feet those human males appreciated. Pathetic. I twisted slightly to enhance the curves I'd augmented, trying to catch his attention while seeming helpless. After all, what was better than body language? As I predicted, he lunged forward to rescue me. I allowed him to pull me into an embrace, using the opportunity to stare into his eyes. The boy was handsome, a catch fit for a queen. If I could convince him to kiss me, that would seal the deal as much as a signature. You're such a gentleman, I cooed, 
pushing an extra sparkle into my cerulean blues. His beard was cut closer than most of those other raiders, a nice dark color that the waves had turned black. Just right. He leaned closer. I smiled. Then he let go of me and lurched away. No, I'm sorry, but no. My place is on the surface. I'm human, he said, shaking his head. This wouldn't work at all. You stupid boy. Don't you know what I'm offering you? A chance at riches and power. Far more than all those trinkets in your silly little boat will give you. It is with great respect that I decline. You are a fine lady. So beautiful that I'm sure I'm the biggest fool ever to draw breath. But my life is not finished. There is too much for me to see and do yet. I need more time. How could he still deny me? Some of my anger seeped out before I could stop it, and I returned to my beautiful, queenly form, only much larger. The bubble couldn't hold me, and I let it pop. He was right in his self-assessment, that was sure. Maybe he wasn't as intelligent as I first thought. Reining in my senses, I settled into a more human size. Errold flailed around, trying to get his bearings, since my waters had surrounded him once more. I took hold of his chin between my thumb and fingers to make sure he paid attention. If you want to go, then leave. But know this, the sea is not my only home. Wherever you go, I'll be nearby. Ha, that ought to make him shiver like a goby until he came to his senses. His eyes grew wide as he fought to hold his breath. I waved my hands, and a current tossed him back to those humans he needed so much more than me. Mara and Mary were still up there, my poor girls, staying put and keeping their restricted shapes until I called them home. That was true loyalty. I should have learned by now not to trust humans. It was going to take a much bigger demonstration to break their hold on my prince. Chapter 7. Errold A freezing current sent me tumbling toward the underside of the ship. I fought to right myself and make it to the surface. Something hard slammed against my back. Bubbles restricted my vision. My lungs burned. Salty seawater filled my nose. My arms and legs slowed, no longer in a rush to get me anywhere. Something dark swam near. I swiped my hand to keep it away, but it bit me. No, it was too hard to be a creature. Forcing myself to stay coherent, I peered again at what kept coming close. It was an oar. My men were trying to help. I grabbed hold and felt the water rush around me. Fresh air chilled my face as I gasped my first sweet breath. Seconds later, the wooden hull dug into my side before I landed in a heap on the ship's floor. Errold, say something! Dag's voice sounded muffled through the water clinging to the inside of my ears. I sputtered and vomited, but I managed to crawl to my knees. Hardy hands slammed against my back until I waved them away. Thanks, I croaked, rolling to sit on a coil of rope. I leaned against the side of the ship until I could breathe regularly. I thought Rand's net had you for sure, Gorin said, kneeling next to me. Now that you're safe, you'll bring us good luck for the rest of the journey home. Squeezing my shoulder, he rose to his feet. He's going to need warmed up, ladies. Maybe you can make him some room, Dag laughed, and the others joined him. I'm fine where I am. Let's just get the sail up and make speed. Mara snorted and stared out at the horizon. You're a fool if you think you can deny her. Don't speak like that. The goddess can snare her treasures someplace else today, Dag answered. Mara stared directly at me. How did she know what just happened? I wanted to convince myself that it had all been a dream, that I must have hit my head when I helped my friend back aboard, but her serious expression said otherwise. Combined with the glare Mary aimed at me, it seemed they knew all too well what I'd been through. Ran isn't who you should worry about, Mara turned her gaze to Dag. Queen Dessa rules all the gods of the sea. All the men stopped working on the sail and stared at her. That's enough, or we'll toss you over to see for yourself the dangers that live below the waves. I meant it as a threat, 
but Mary nodded her head with such vigor she gave me pause. Mara touched her leg, and Mary dropped her gaze to her lap. My sister doesn't understand things sometimes, she shrugged. I'm sorry for the offense. Is there something wrong with her that she can't talk? Dag asked. Mary tilted her chin to gaze at my friend and smiled. An answering grin split his face, but I saw the glint in her eye. There was far more to those two girls than anyone knew. She's mute, Mara answered. She bragged once that she could sing better than anyone. The queen demands that no one have skills greater than her own, so she removed Mary's voice and keeps it in a shell she wears as a necklace. Mary sighed and nodded slowly in agreement. Silence weighted the air. The rough fibers of the ropes dug into my palms as I clenched them until my knuckles were white. I'd seen that shell around Dessa's neck. Gorin let out a huge belly laugh. Dag chuckled after him, and the rest of the men joined in. My shoulders released some of their tension, but only until I met Mara's gaze. She leaned nearer to me. If you cared about your men, you would have accepted her offer. Settling her back once more against the crates, she arched a brow at me. I turned my focus to Mary, who wiggled her fingers at Dag, causing the big man to offer a foolish grin. What he mistook as flirtation, I saw as a farewell. Chapter 8 Dessa No one had ever rejected me. Well, no one still alive. It grated on me that I'd let Errol go back to his ship. What did that say? One little slip like that, and I'd have all the other sea gods thinking they could take my place. No, it wouldn't do. I'd heard those puny humans aboard Errol's ship asking about Ran. Did no one remember me? The Queen of the Abyss? Ruler of the Nereti? Mistress of Shadows? Goddess of Night and Chaos? The seas obeyed my commands and never failed me. That's how I restored my nerves and stayed so tolerant. Errold thought he could control his own destiny, but I'd make him beg for my forgiveness. As my anger rose, so did the wind, bringing the waves to soaring heights. I rolled my neck as the power rippled from me. Such a relief it gave. I let my body grow, though I stayed below the surface. It was better to let the anticipation build. The screams and fear of the warriors above sang almost as sweetly as the voices of my maidens. The raiders were adept at keeping their ship afloat. Convincing Errol to join me was going to take more effort than I thought. I allowed a smile to bloom. Creating storms was one of my specialties. And the stronger, the better to release my energies. I raised my arms and spun as if in a dance. The air, black as midnight, crackled with lightning. The wind roared with wicked pleasure. The waves tossed the ship about us as if it were a toy. It was mine. When the ship managed to ride a wave three times its size and stay upright, I tried a different approach. Perhaps these men deserved some recognition. I plucked new servants from ships all the time whenever I needed them. These pirates seemed to be stuck like an octopus in its cave. I inhaled and let myself relax a touch, then sent a current directly to the underside of the ship. From out of nowhere, and unlike the pattern of the other waves, so the humans wouldn't have time to adapt. Two bodies splashed into the water. That's better. Neither of them was Errold, though. That was expected. My prince was better than the rest. If he had fallen after such a trivial push, I'd have had to rethink his position. Mary met my gaze as she readied to dive over the side and join me. Then someone grabbed her and pulled her back. How dare they stop my girls from coming back to their mother? With a sweep of my arms, I sent another current rushing to the surface. The ship leaned sideways until the mast dug into a neighboring wave. Somehow, it righted itself. It had to be Errol's doing. He truly was worthy of me. But his tenacity grew tiresome. Waiting for what I wanted was not in my nature. I stirred up the sea and the sky before I called to Errol. 
This is your doing, my love. Choose to join me, and I'll spare your men. I wasn't sure I'd really decided to do that, but it sounded like something he might want to hear. He didn't answer me. Instead, I heard him shout orders to release the cargo. His treasures meant nothing. Why was he so difficult? He would be mine, one way or another. Chapter 9. Errold After we'd lost two men, I insisted everyone get securely lashed to the ship in some way. We used enough rope to allow movement, but not enough to get tangled. Mary almost fell overboard too, but we'd managed to save her. The way we'd nearly capsized at that last wave made me take drastic action and toss our spoils. The voice I'd heard, though, gave me doubt it would be enough. Every time I caught a glance from Mara or Mary, they seemed peaceful, as if they were just waiting for the inevitable. Mara had warned me. Would it all stop if I agreed to join Dessa? I didn't have time to give it more thought as all our treasures slipped overboard. We needed to lighten the ship quickly. Every man grabbed what he could while fighting for balance. I could see the disgust on their faces as they lost everything they'd earned from the summer raids. If I could manage to keep us all alive, I'd make it up to them. This won't work, Mara said to me. She didn't even lift her voice. I heard it in my mind like a shimmery ray of sunshine, warm and glowing. It was the same way Dessa's voice had drawn me. Why are you here? I screamed over the maelstrom, even though I'd moved closer to her without realizing it. To find you, she grinned at me. Our mother will call us back, but for now we wait until you decide. Their mother? My eyelids drooped along with my hope. There wasn't a way to survive this. Not for me. Before I could reconsider my decision, the wind carried a scream to my ears. I spun to see Dag trapped between the ship's hull and a large crate. A wave washed the deck once more, and water filled the area where Dag struggled. He was too far for any of us to reach. Someone would need to cut his ropes to save him. I wouldn't let anyone else risk themselves. There was only one way to keep the men safe, and I knew what I had to do. A certain amount of peace filled me, knowing I'd go down to the depths of the sea having at least allowed most of my friends to carry on. With the dagger on my belt, I cut through the ropes holding me to the base of the mast and fought my way to Dag, grabbing onto the side of the hull as I pulled myself along. Each time the ship tilted, Dag's area flooded. I had to work fast. Holding my breath, I went under and assessed how he was caught. The rope that tied him safely to the ship was caught under the loose crate. I came up for air. If I cut the rope, he'd go overboard with me. Instead, I crawled over the bigger man and practically sat on his chest. I wedged myself between the crate and the hull, pushing my feet against the ship as my back shoved the crate off the rope. Dag grabbed the rope and pulled it at the same time. Two more waves washed over us before the crate finally shifted enough, and Dag scrambled back in freedom. I smiled at him and reached out my arm. He grasped my forearm tightly and pulled me safely away from the edge. Release the maids! I yelled into his ear over the wind. His brows pinched as he yanked back to stare into my face. I smiled and nodded. It was an odd request, for sure, and one he would think cruel. I wasn't known for making sacrifices like that. Dag hesitated for a heartbeat, then nodded in acknowledgement, even if he didn't understand. I watched him make his way toward the women. Mary kept her eyes glued to his, but Mara watched me. My jaw ached with how hard I clenched my teeth. When Dag cut their ropes, Mary immediately threw herself overboard. Mara arched a brow at me, waiting. I gave one last glance at my men and dove over the side. Chapter 10 Dessa Finally, I watched as Errold tumbled end over end in the waves near the surface. Mary swam to my side, but Mara hadn't arrived yet. If she didn't arrive soon, I'd crack that ship apart. Even though I had what I wanted, those humans would not keep one of my girls. Mara's sleek scales glittered as she darted through the waves toward Errold. She took hold of his arm and balanced him next to her. 
I narrowed my eyes as I watched. It was unexpected for any of my maids to interfere in my business. That was something I'd need to monitor. Errold held his breath and didn't seem as though he could stay conscious much longer. I still needed him to agree to my terms, so I created the air-filled bubble again. He gasped and heaved in the necessary substance for his human form. Good work, girls. They had done their job, and I wanted to make sure Errold realized it as well. Does this mean you'll be my prince? I asked, turning my attention in his direction. I'm prepared to give my life if you'll spare my men. Stop the storm and let them sail home in safety. Begging wasn't new. I'd heard pleas for every bargain imaginable, but never had anyone stopped to negotiate on behalf of someone else. A slight tug at the back of my mind wondered if his character might be too good. I couldn't have that kind of attitude infecting my fortress. I shook my head and scoffed at myself. Of course, he'd come to me with ridiculous human ideals. They could be overcome. That wasn't an agreement. I'm not asking to take your life. I'm offering to give you one. It didn't hurt to allow the ship to remain intact. The men had proven worthy adversaries, and it actually pleased me that I might play with them again sometime. Though he hadn't agreed, and the terms had to be clear or there would be a loophole for him to wiggle through. Take my life, but becoming your prince still doesn't suit me. The boy was far more impressive than I'd given him credit for. Fine, I'll sweeten the deal, but you have to sign the contract before I'll stop the storm. Since you seem to love the humans so much, I'll allow you three days ashore every thirty years. His brows pinched together, as if he still wasn't sure he liked what I'd generously offered. Don't worry, it's only for three hundred years. Merfolk don't live forever, after all. Besides, you'll still have your pretty face. Think of it. Time will fly by with all the fun we'll have in thirty years. You might even lose your silly connection to such limited creatures. I watched as he tilted his chin and stared at the ship, still battling the storm over our heads. With a sigh, I examined my beautiful nails while I waited. What happens if I still say no? A grumble rattled my chest at his impudence. Then you'll drown, but not until after you watch your ship crack apart and all those men die. If you want to save their lives, my sweet, you've got to pay the toll. Fine, I agree. With a flash, I produced a scroll and unfurled it to expose the terms of our deal. He gave one more quick glance over his head, then signed his name with the quill hovering near his hand. I closed my eyes and savored the sweet taste of victory. One last item, and then I'd quell the seas. Cordata Bellana, Fortress of Fire, uphold this decree. Membrumix Inferis, Anator Parturis, ad vitam to me. Flashes of light, vibrant and more beautiful than fireworks, sizzled through the water as the bubble surrounding Errold burst. Chapter 11, Errold As soon as I'd finished my name, I felt the difference. Dessa chanted those strange words, then I was blinded. Based on how deeply underwater we were, the glaring light didn't make sense. Suddenly my shoulders were wrenched in one direction, and my feet in another. My stomach and all my insides swirled and fought against each other. The worst pain attacked my legs. Each joint separated so they hung uselessly. I wondered if they were even still attached. Dizziness clouded my thoughts when a constriction began in my lower body and knitted my two limbs into one. My spine jerked as if being stretched to my feet. I stopped breathing, hoping I'd succumb to death, but I didn't. When the flashing lights stopped and the darkness descended once more, I heaved from exhaustion, then gasped. Breath came to me, even though I no longer floated inside Dessa's bubble. Mara and Mary both hovered a few feet in front of me, smiles splitting their faces and beaming with pride. So handsome, Dessa's voice rattled through me from somewhere over my shoulder. She sounded impressed. I was afraid to look at myself. Instead, I tilted my chin toward the skies. 
sunbeams angled through the surface where placid waters replaced the hurricane of moments before. If nothing else, Dessa appeared to be a woman of her word. Let's go. I've had enough of this petty surface business, Dessa said. Mara and Mary gave a flick of their tails and glided smoothly by me on either side, quick to follow. No longer under their scrutiny, I took the chance to glance at myself. I'd always had a solid build like my fellow warriors, but one that needed more bulk, I'd thought. No longer, since my chest had broadened and my muscles strengthened in a way that would pull me easily through the waters. I closed my eyes for a split second before I continued. Green scales with flecks of teal and blue began just under my belly button. Glittering in the low light, they covered my entire lower body, which ended in a split tail. I bent my legs upward in a way that wouldn't have been possible before, and my whole lower half curled forward. That explained the pain in my knees. The joints I'd had before were gone and replaced with muscles and sinew that moved like... a fish's. Come, Erald, you can admire my work later, Dessa called. I turned to face her, surprised by the ease of the movement. I want to go to the surface first. You agreed to save my men, and I want to see them. Whatever fear I should have felt now that I was a member of the Sea Queen's court didn't register. Thankfully, my mind was still my own. In less time than it should have taken her to reach me, Dessa floated in front of my face. Her hand came up and cupped the side of my cheek. I felt the bristle of my beard under her fingers and couldn't help the grin. When I'd finally managed to grow a man's beard, I'd relished the maturity I'd believed it gave me. At least I still had that. We'll all go and see off your former life. It's good to have closure, Dessa cooed into my ear. A shudder rolled through me that I didn't bother to hide, and she laughed. I followed her to the surface, my new appendage gliding me easily through the sea. Mara and Mary surfaced as well. The four of us watched as, one by one, the men on my ship slowly moved away from the sides of the hull, accepting my death. They began to secure what cargo they had left to leave without me. Minutes later, they hoisted the large square sail, and it billowed as the wind caught hold. A deep ache squeezed my chest as the ship and my life as a human vanished into the horizon. Mary disappeared from my side, then propelled herself from the waters into the air, spinning, then slicing back under the surface with a graceful arch. "'You should try it. It's fun,' Mara said playfully. Then she mimicked her sister as I watched. I was not of the mind for such frivolity, and slipped below the waves. Mara and Mary's iridescent purple scales glinted as they sped away and then back to me. Dessa waited not far off. My men will sing songs of me, I said to none of them in particular, trying to soothe myself. I sighed. Testing out my tail, I gave it a flick and propelled faster than I expected. I leaned to the left and barrel rolled, followed by a somersault. The tail, which had tortured me when it formed, now gave me more freedom than I'd understood possible. Mara smiled at me. I curved my lips in return, but my thoughts stirred. Perhaps I could find a way to break the curse during my three days ashore. In thirty years. Until then, I had to accept what I could no longer change, as I followed the three women into the deep. I hope you enjoyed listening to Realm of Sea Castles by Kelly and Jane, narrated by Corinne Norton and by Peter Franson of Christian Geek Central. If you want to read more by Kelly, go to kellynjane.com to find more of her books. You can sign up there for her newsletter and get your own copy of Realm of Sea Castles. But as a special treat for Finding Fantasy Reads listeners, Kelly has given me a link that will also get you her book Rise of Dragons for free. So be sure to click on the show notes so you can snag that as well. If you enjoyed listening to Pater narrate the story, you might also enjoy listening to his podcast, Christian Geek Central where he discusses movies, video games, and all things enjoyed by self-proclaimed geeks from a Christian worldview. This month, we have another giveaway, and Kelly N. Jane has included a signed paperback copy of the first book in her latest series, Rune of Secrets, 
It's an epic fantasy adventure with slow burn romance. So head on over to findingfantasyreads.com slash giveaway to enter today. Last but not least, I want to give a special shout out to my sister-in-law, Holly, this month. She has been a huge supporter of Pater and me getting this podcast off the ground. And not just because she's obligated to as his wife and my sister-in-law. She has faithfully listened to every episode for me to catch any editing errors. I think she's even listened to a couple twice. You should be thankful to her too, because she catches a lot, whether it's duplicate lines or terrible mispronunciations. Because you guys, I learned my vocabulary from reading, not talking. So I don't know how to pronounce half of the unusual words, or really even the normal ones. It's embarrassing. Anyway, thank you, Holly, for all that you do. For the rest of you, if you missed any of the links, they will be in the show notes. Thank you all for listening, and happy reading.